here, and this is the Money Made Easy series. We're going to talk a little bit about the stock market as well as the bond market. But each class, I like to review the five steps that we use, and we're going to tie that in right now. So step number one is to make money. And the reason I go into this every time is because I want to make sure that this really gets into your head to be able to follow these five steps. So step number one is to make money. Number two is to separate your money. Step number three is you need to give some of it away to your church or charity of your choice. Number four, which we're going to talk about today, is to save and invest. And then number five, of course, is to spend the rest. Now, our goal is to figure out how to make more money into the top of our funnel. Most people have a job, the spouse has a job, and that's the only way that you're getting any income in there. We need to learn how to make chunks of cash and streams of income. And we're going to use the stock market to do that. Okay? And you can make chunks of cash that go into the top of your funnel, and we can also create streams of income that come down here. Now, for today's purposes, though, I really want to spend quality time talking about this section number here, number four. In fact, I'm going to start with number four here at the top so you can see what I'm trying to accomplish. So step number four is to save and invest. And I told you in an earlier class that the wealth that you receive is made up of three things. Number one is the money that you put into your investment accounts on a monthly basis. And as you go through some of the earlier classes, you can see how dramatic that is if you do that at a young age, the longer you have. So the key number one is to put money in on a monthly basis. Now people say, well, I'm afraid of the stock market. It might go down in value. The question is, when are you selling? Now, if you're selling next week, then that's a concern. If you're selling five years from now, it's not a concern. In fact, we want the stock market to go down so we can buy more shares of it. So the first thing is, is that we have to put money in on a monthly basis. We have to water our money tree every month. Now, we're going to times that by a good rate of return. We want our, our investments to go up in value, and we want it to go up faster than inflation. And the third step is that we want it to go over a long period of time. So we want to put more money in times a really good rate of return times a long time. That's going to equal a big net worth. Now, in addition to that, this is assets that you have. We want our assets to produce income for us that we can live off of. The goal is to have enough assets with your real estate, your stock, your small business, that you have a big net worth of assets that produce income so that you can live off that income and then say, forget about having a job. We want to be able to live off the income. And that's something my dad taught me when I was very young. Uh, he said that some people make so much money off their small businesses, their real estate, and their investments that they don't have a job. They just manage their money. They planted a whole orchard of money trees. And so I want to get very deeply into that part right here. But this is our goal. We want to put money in on a monthly basis times a really good rate of return. Remember, we've talked about the rule of 72 in previous classes. How long does it take for an investment to double in value times a long period of time? That will produce a big net worth. We want our net worth to be able to produce monthly income. We also want to be able to take income from our small businesses, our network marketing, our real estate rentals, whatever that might be, and have that add to that monthly income so you'll have plenty of money to be able to live on. And so, so where this really came into why I had to start thinking this way was that when I was a young man, when I was 34 years of age, I actually had a heart attack. And I had some very small children at the time. And I remember as they were wheeling me down into the operating room if I was coming back because one third of the people that have a heart attack, the first sign that they have any problem is death. And so I was very, very lucky. And I remember thinking to myself, well, if I don't come back, who's going to take care of this special needs child of mine? I actually have two special needs children. And I have a child that is, is never going to make any money that is going to need financial help the rest of his life. Now, if we both lived a normal lifespan, 
I'm going to be on this earth for 30 years after he's, I'm, he's, he's going to be on this earth for 30 years after I'm dead and gone. So that's why it was so important that I was able to create a big net worth and to be able to create income streams to take care of him. So getting back to our piece right here, let's get into step number four and talk about your asset allocation and the money that you have coming in. So here is number four, save and invest. Now, as you have money coming into step number four, you have to decide what you're going to do with it. The greatest stock picker, the greatest businessman out there, as far as the stock market is concerned, is Mr. Warren Buffett. And this is a person that you need to study. You need to model him and understand how he does what he does and how he thinks. And of the five steps, he spends the vast majority of his time allocating assets. He doesn't manage the businesses. He doesn't go find the businesses. Uh, he manages the profits that they make so that they can make more profits. That's what he's best at. But as you get money coming in, there's a couple places we're going to put it. Number one is we're going to put some into savings. Now your goal is to be able to have some into savings. And your goal is to have between two, four, maybe even six months of what we call an emergency fund. Now the reason for this is, is that if you lose your job, we don't want you to have to live off of credit cards. We want to put some money away in a long-term savings account that is always there for you to have that cash that you need if there's a problem. Start with, start with $500, then move it up to 1000 then move it up a little bit more than that. Uh, but your goal, depending on your comfort level, is anywhere between two to four months of extra money to be able to take care of your needs if something happens to you. Some of that money that comes in, that's the safe part. The next part is to invest. Now, there's two major ways to do that. One is either you loan or you own. And all the investments really come down to those two things. Are you loaning somebody money or are you owning part of the business? Okay? And so when you loan money, this is a part that is broken down into smaller groups. For example, when you put money into your checking account, you're dropping money into the bank to the checking. You're loaning money to the bank. You've actually made a loan to the bank. You put money into your checking, they're going to take that money and they're going to go loan it out to someone else. If you have money into your savings account, the bank's going to take that money and they're going to re-loan it out. In fact, with the way that the government works is that if you have one dollar in there, they can loan out as many as four, six, eight, ten times that amount to in loans. We call it fractional banking. Very interesting. But this is part of what you're doing. You're actually loaning. So you can loan money to the bank. You can also uh, loan money in what we call a bond. So I'm going to call that a bond. Now, what's a bond? Uh, back when the war was happening, um, we used to have, uh, have where the government would say, we need money. We need money to be able to finance the war. So we're going to do U.S. savings bonds. So we're going to borrow some money from you, and we'll just say it's $1,000 to keep the math simple, and we're going to pay you a 3% rate of return on it, and we're going to keep the money for five years. We're going to keep the money for five years, and at the end of that five years, you can ask for your money back, and we will have paid you a profit. So let's say if it was a $100 bond at 3%, that means at the end of the first year, they would owe you $100 plus $3, which equals $103. And so that's what a bond is. You loaned money to the government. Okay? And you also make other kinds of loans. Uh, when a brand new school is being built, they need money for that. They, that what they call it a floating a bond. And they go out to the marketplace and say, we need millions of dollars to build this brand new school. And so we're going to go borrow millions of dollars at a low interest rate, and we're going to have people that we're going to pay that back to. Now, in the case of a school district, the way they make money is that, that all the people in the neighborhood, in the area, are paying property tax. That property tax comes in, they know it's going to come in, and that money comes in to pay the loan back. So if you have extra cash uh, and you put that in there, say, I'm going to loan money on a school, and they will pay that back to you. Uh, you can loan money to a corporation. Uh, let's say that the corporations are growing, and they need to raise money to be able to finance their growth you can actually do what we call corporate bonds where you loan money to a corporation it usually has some kind of a frame of one year 
two years, five years, 10 years, uh, even 30 years bonds that they're going to pay you back uh, on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, a yearly basis, but it has an interest rate return on that of some percent that they're going to pay you back. Now, is that safe? Yeah, it's pretty safe. If you loan money to the government, we're going to loan money to the government. Is the government going to pay you back? <laughs> well, we hope so. Um, but that's what you call a government bond. Um, all the government's going to do is print more money. If they don't have enough money, they're going to borrow one way or another. They're going to print more money, and that really causes inflation. So on a bond, it's pretty safe. Uh, General Motors, many years ago, they were expanding, and they borrowed money from bondholders. And so bondholders would put their money together, and they would loan it to a big corporation like General Motors. Now, when General Motors had problems, and it went bankrupt because of all the issues that happened after uh, um, some of the big financial crises, the stockholders in bankruptcy got wiped out. They're just gone. You're a stockholder. The value of the company is not worth that much. It's only worth this much. And we owe this much money. In fact, the value of the company is even less. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Here, here is the value of the company. We're just going to say that's 100%. That's 100%. We, we have loans of 70%. And then the equity is 30%. The, the stockholders own 30% of it, and the bondholders who loaned money to General Motors, we're just making this number up, but it's 70%. And so they borrowed 70% from bondholders. The rest of it they sold in the market to stockholders. Now, in the big crash, the value of General Motors went down. And let's say that it went down so it was only worth 50% as much as it was five years earlier. The car sales went down, something happened, and the value of that corporation went down. Well, the stockholders in bankruptcy basically got wiped out. The bondholders were owed 70%. The value is only worth 50%. So yes, you can take a loss by doing a bond. So that's why we say we're not, we don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. Now, let me give you another example uh, about a, a bond. And again, people say, well, it's safe. I'm never going to lose any money. And if you hold on to that bond and you never sell it, then you're correct. Okay? If you hold on to that bond and don't sell it, you're correct. But the way that this works is let's say that we have something, and I'm going to use an easy number to make sure that you understand it, of $100. And we're going to say that the interest rate on that is 3%. So on a yearly basis, you're going to make $3 in profit. Okay? So it's a $100 bond at 3% equals $3 in profit per year. And the key is you have to hold it for five years. So that's a bond that you've invested in. I'm going to buy a bond. I'm going to loan money to the bank, the co a country, a corporation, a municipality, whatever it is. And so for every $100 I do at 3% means I'm going to make $3 a year on it but it's tied up for five years. Now this is, now if you never sell it, you never redeem it, and you say, I'm willing to wait for those five years, then you'll get your money as long as they pay off. Now the vast majority of bondholders uh, pay off, the vast, vast majority. That's why we, when we do a, a whole basket of bonds, we will do many different companies and different kinds. We're not putting all of our eggs in one basket in case one goes sideways. But on that same example, if you have a company uh, that is offering a 6% bond. Well, that 6%, if it's going to produce $3 a year, the value of that bond, the value or the loan amount, is only 50. See how I did that? If you take 100 times 3%, that's $3 in interest profit per year. Now, if someone's loaning and borrowing money at a 6% return, and it's going to produce that same $3 in interest. How much is the principal balance? Well, it's only 50. If you went down to the bank and you put $100 in the bank and they said, I'm going to pay you 3%, uh, that would be $3 a year. If you went down to the bank and said, here's $50, but you have to pay me 6%, that's $3 a year. So if you own a bond right here, and the interest rates spike, they go up, they double, they go from 3% to 6%. And now if you wanted to borrow money from the same organization, but it's at 
to be equal to that previous one that was only producing three dollars this bond is only worth fifty dollars so I'm saying that if you have this bond and you wanted to cash out the prevailing rates in the marketplace said that the value of that bond is only really worth 50 bucks. So it went down in half. So now if you hold on to it for five years, you're going to collect your 3% and you'll be just fine. You won't lose any value in your bond. But you can lose money on a bond if you have to sell. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense to you. So yes, so the same is true with all kinds of bonds and all kinds of loans. What's the true value of that loan? And what is the true value of the asset above it? Uh, in the housing crisis market that happened many years ago, uh, loans were being made on properties that the value just wasn't there. And they, they propped them up, low interest rates, propped them up on a teaser rate. And then what happened was they jumped that rate a couple percentage points. And that had a lot of those properties where the owners could no longer pay the payments. They sent the, the, the keys back, they let them foreclose. And then all this new pro all these new properties that had been out there producing income went the other direction. So yes, it is possible to lose money on a bond. But again, as long as you buy it, you hold it for the duration, you won't lose money on the value of it, but it just won't produce as much money as the others. Okay? So that's a bond. That's part of the loan section. Now, the next part is that you own. Now, what do you own? Well, there's three or four different major things that you can own. Number one, you can own individual stocks. You can pick and choose the stocks that you want to, to own. You can own Apple, you can own McDonald's, you can own General Motors. You can pick and choose what stocks that you want to, to buy. You can buy and sell them on the same day. I have a friend that, that does trading like that and he does extremely well. Uh, and, and you can buy individual stocks. Number two is you can buy what we call a mutual fund. Now, a mutual fund is made up of many different stocks that a professional manager is going to manage for you. Companies like Fidelity, uh, Schwab have their own mutual funds, and they get a professional manager that says, I'm going to buy this company and this company and this company and this company and this company. And I've got a, a good idea that these are the companies that will do very well. And they have different kinds of objectives, like, for example, a growth mutual fund. A growth mutual fund is the manager saying, hey, I'm going to go look at all the stocks that are out there available to buy, and I'm going to buy just the ones that I think are going to go up in value. They're growth stocks. Okay? Uh, there is companies that are saying, I'm looking for value. They go out and they say, hey, this company right now, if you took all the stock and sold it, would be worth 100, um, but we think that the real value is 200. We're going to buy it below market. We're going to buy it at, at, at a value. There's income, and these companies produce a dividend. Every year they produce a dividend and they send you a little money as part of the profits that they make. Okay, that's a dividend, uh, a mutual fund. And there's actually more mutual funds out there than there are stocks. And now the negative to this is, is that you have to pay fees to that mutual fund manager. And there's two kinds of ways to do that. One is one that they call a load, and the other one is a no load. And what that simply means is, is that when you buy a mutual fund or invest some of your money into a mutual fund, and it has a load, that means there's a maybe a 3% sales commission. So if you invest $100, they're going to charge you $3 just for executing the trade and putting it in there. Now, the second thing that they're going to do is that they're going to charge you some monthly fees. Okay? And so you've also got what they call money under management month. And so if you have $100 in there, they're going to say for every $100 you have invested, we're going to charge you between 1 and 2% to manage it. So every year we're going to charge you 1% to 2% if the stock goes up, stock goes down, we don't care. We get paid to do the management. So on a load fund, they're going to charge you when you buy it, and they're going to charge you money under management. As long as they control your money under managing it, they're going to charge you money. Now, a no-load fund is a little bit differently. They're saying, hey, we're, going to, we're not going to charge you any fee. It's going to be basically a zero fee, but we're going to maybe jack up 
this to be a higher rate on your money under management. That's where you got to look at the small print. But that's basically a mutual fund. Now, mutual funds are really good. There's some great mutual funds out there, and they do really well. Now, the third area that I want to talk about is what we call an index fund, or something like the S&P 500 or the Dow 30. And what they are, it's very simple. They say, we're going to buy the, the S&P 500, we're going to buy the 500 biggest companies in America, which are global. So these 500 companies that we're going to buy, we're not going to we're, we're not going to decide any of this stuff. We're just saying, hey, we're just gambling. We're just investing in the 500 biggest companies in the United States, which are all global. I've had McDonald's hamburgers <laughs> everywhere I've been. There hasn't been a place where I haven't been able to find that. Or a Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is even more. Now, if you say, well, I don't think I've seen a Coca-Cola in India. Well, if you look at the label it's probably one of Coca-Cola's products. Coca-Cola has hundreds and hundreds of different brands that it controls, not only just Coke. And so, so the S&P 500 is the 500 largest companies. And what they say is, we're not going to decide if it's a growth or value or income. We're just going to take the biggest ones and we're going to invest in that. As a result, the money under management percent goes down. Okay, because we're not, we're not actively trading it. We're just taking the top 500 the commission probably is going to be less because we don't have to make anything up. We're just buying the 500 biggest companies. Okay. And so that's what we call the S and P 500. Now the Dow 30 is very, is somewhat similar in that there's 30 companies out of this big chunk of all these individual companies. There's 30 companies there. Now you hear the Dow every day on the radio, the Dow did this, the Dow did that. And the vast majority of people in America and all over the world have no idea what it is. Well, it's very simple. It's made up of one computer company in the computer industry. It's made up of one software company. It's made up of one a home builder. It's made of one a car dealer, a uh, manufacturer. And so it, it's one food company. And what it does is it takes the 30 biggest industries and it takes a sampling of a company in that industry. Okay? And so that's what the Dow 30 is. And there's 30 companies in there. And so when you invest some of your money into the Dow 30 or the S&P 500, which is an index, then you are buying either the 500 biggest companies or the 30 that represent part of the different industries. You've also heard of the Russell 2000. The Russell 2000 is the next biggest companies. The S&P is the first 500. The Russell is, is company number 501 to, to 2500. It's the next biggest. So we also call that a large cap. The S&P has a big capitalization. It's the biggest companies. And so that's why we call that a large cap. A, a mid cap is the next biggest companies out there by value. And then a, a small cap is really the smaller companies, the startup companies. And sometimes the startup companies will do better on a performance than the larger companies. Okay? And so that's basically an index fund. Now, one of the ones that I really like to have uh, people that I teach about investing is basically Berkshire Hathaway, BRKB. Now Berkshire Hathaway is actually an individual stock. It's an individual stock. You can buy uh, Berkshire Hathaway just like you can buy Apple or McDonald's or GM. It's an individual company. But the reason that I like it so much is because it's, it's a company that Warren Buffett created and, and that he bought and started with. And as I've mentioned in many of my classes, I am a huge Warren Buffett fan. Um, I've, been, I've been an investor with his company. I bought his stock for many, many years. Um, I follow him all the time on YouTube. Uh, I'm just interested in what he says and, and what, how he believes in the marketplace. He's a great long-term investor. And in fact, if, if you buy his A share, um, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars and it was very small to begin with. But, but if, if I was to advise you on just a simple company that I'd recommend or a simple stock, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Berkshire Hathaway. Now Berkshire Hathaway, and again, the reason I really like this is because of what this guy does and how he believes. He's a long-term thinker. And Berkshire Hathaway is actually was two mills, kind of like woolen mills that would actually make clothing. Now, he took control of those companies with investors. 
he started the Buffett Partnerships, and then he would take other people's money, put it under management, so he was making a percent on all the money under management, and he actually made a percentage of the profit too, kind of like a hedge fund guy. But what he did was that he decided that he wanted to buy into these textile mills. And one of the companies was called Berkshire, and the other company was called Hathaway. And as the textile mills started losing business in New England, they were shipping all the business. All the business was being done overseas because labor cost was less. They didn't have the same pollution standards that we do in America. And so the business um, went overseas. And so these companies started losing value. And he basically came in, took control of that company with partners, and uh, borrowed money, whatever it was, and he bought them out. And so he took control of Berkshire Hathaway, and he became the largest shareholder in that entity. Now, Berkshire Hathaway was actually, if you listen to, to Warren talk, he'll say that that was one of the worst investments he ever made, was buying Berkshire Hathaway because he, he bought a company in textiles that was losing market share, and it was losing um, all of its business to overseas because it was cheaper to do business overseas. But what he did was he took the company, and he took the value of the company, and he sold off chunks of it, and he invested it into insurance companies. So if you really look at Berkshire Hathaway today, you can say, well, really, what is Berkshire Hathaway? Well, Berkshire Hathaway is really a big insurance company. Uh, you've heard of Geico Insurance. Uh, it's an insurance company. Now, the beauty of this is that they do a lot of insurance on vehicles. Geico is actually a government employee insurance company. That's what Geico stands for. And he really liked that model. And so we started buying stock in that company, in Geico, many, many years ago. And what he really loved about being in the insurance business was that they would write, they would get a premium, they would get money in today. If you have a car, for example, and you need insurance on your car, you make a, you make a premium payment today. And then you're gonna make a payment basically every month or every year to pay for your insurance. Now, you may not have a wreck or for a year. Let's say that you do that. So let's say that you have all these people that are paying you premiums. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, thousands of them, thousands of them. Well, only a small percent are going to have a wreck where they're going to have to do something to fix the car. So they bring in all these premiums, all this money on a, on a monthly basis. And then they get to hold that money um, in reserve until they have to pay out a premium. Somebody wrecks their car, they need to fix it. So not only do they make a profit on all of that, because they're, they're covering a lot of people, they have very few accidents, they're making a profit, but the biggest thing is that they have what we call float. Float, the word float. Now what that means is that they bring in a dollar today and they don't have an expense for a year, two years, three years, four years, five years until they need that money back to pay a premium. And what happens is that the new people come in, old people drop off, that keeps growing. Right now, Berkshire Hathaway has $105 billion, $105 billion in what we call float. And float is money they brought in today that they're holding in reserve in case that person has an accident. What it is, is basically they have access to $105 billion dollars with no cost because at the end of the day they're going to make not only are they using the money for free but they're also going to to make a profit on that so what do they do with this 105 billion dollars they buy companies they buy stock back many years ago they bought a whole bunch of coca-cola now as i mentioned i've been around the world twice there has not been a place that i've ever been where i have not found a coca-cola product now i don't drink coke um, I drink water, I and mean, lots of water, but they have Dasani water. So as you look at the back of, of, of uh, the labels, you're going to see who owns those, and they have hundreds and hundreds of different brands. And so they own a big chunk of Coca-Cola. They own a big chunk of Wells Fargo Bank. They own a big chunk of Bank of America. They own a big chunk of IBM. They own Gillette Razors. Um, and his philosophy is very simple. He says, every morning I know that there's millions of men that wake up that have to shave. So I want to be in a business where, where they have to shave, so they need a product. 
and I want to be the number one, number two, or number three biggest um, supplier of that. I want to be the biggest one or in the top three. And Gillette Razors is that. Uh, in the fast food business, he wanted to be in the top three. So he bought Dairy Queen. McDonald's, Burger King are probably the two biggest, and then, and then uh, Dairy Queen is right after that. And so with all this extra money, they have bought all these businesses and all these stock. And the stock has done very well because he's been able to pick. Now, he's also bought hundreds of businesses and companies that fit strategically with what he's doing. So similarly to the S&P 500, which is 500 companies, these are ones that are more hand-picked um, by Warren Buffett and his staff. And again, he just does step number two. He allocates the money. As profits come in, he says, I think these companies are going to do really well. Let's, let's go put the money there. Um, he likes crises. He likes it when uh, the stock market goes down because he's not selling today. He, you know, he wants to buy today, and he wants to buy it at a discount. And so basically, Berkshire Hathaway are these big insurance companies who have a lot of money under float, zero cost for their funds, but buy incredible businesses. And so on average, it does better than the S&P 500. So as you take a look at a measuring stick of how people do with their stock, and again, I started investing with my dad when I was 14 years of age. Now, we were no Warren Buffetts. We would look in the stock pages, and, and, you know, and we were just trying to understand it. Uh, this guy was a, a genius. Uh, but if you look at it and you say, what area are you going to get the best rate of return over the longest period of time? Well, if you put money into your savings account, you're probably going to get 0 to 1%. Not very well, but it's going to be pretty safe and it's going to be liquid and available for you. Uh, if you loan money out and you put it into your checking account or savings account, same thing. Not much. Zero percent, zero percent. If you put it into long-term bonds, you might get three percent. Can the bonds go up in value? Yes. Can they go down in value? Absolutely. Uh, you can buy individual stocks. You can try and time the market. And uh, you're looking at charts. You're trying to guess where it's going to go. Um, and there are people that have uh, done that. You can do options. I have a good friend that does options. Just like you can do an option in real estate, he does options in the stock market where he gets an option and he says, I think this company is going to go up in value, and he actually buys an option on that company instead of the actual stock. But that's another class altogether. So you can buy and sell stock. The problem with that is that most people, um, they hear a great tip from a neighbor. Um, by the time the marketplace understands something that's news, it's too late because the insiders have already taken advantage of it. Okay? And so most people that buy and sell individual stocks, they get a hot tip from a friend or a neighbor, they go put all their money into that asset and it goes down to value and they say, well, I'm just getting out. Or they listen to the news and say, well, the stock market's going to go down, I'm just getting out. And uh, what I've learned is, is that the vast majority of people are wrong. Um, the, you know, if anything, the vast majority of people that have a belief in something uh, is wrong. It, there's a saying that says, uh, find out what everybody else is doing and then don't do it. Go do something else. And so that's the case, same case here. So most people just simply buy and sell individual stocks. And I'm talking from experience. This is what I did for a long time. I, I thought I knew what was going on. I would study charts. I would do whatever. And my problem was, was that what I really learned was is that your number one goal is to make more money with your small businesses and your real estate and your investments. So step number one is to put more money in the top of your funnel. That's the biggest thing that you can do because that's an active activity that's going to take you time and energy to, for you to go do. And then you want to spend the time, your time doing that instead of spending all your time doing this. Basically, Warren Buffett's smarter than I am. I admit it. Uh, my wife would tell you that too. Uh, Warren Buffett's smarter than I am. He he's he just is is, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna put my money with somebody who's smarter than me. I'm smart enough to know that I'm not smarter than him. That he is smarter than I am. He's got more experience. He's been doing this for decades, um, and I can't teach experience. And so he's much smarter than I am. And so you can do individual stocks. You can do mutual funds. Now the problem is is that when it's all said and done after 40 years of uh, learning, investing, starting with my dad with little pieces to investing uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars in all kinds of asset classes. If I only had a few minutes to teach you what you need to know, step one would be this. Number one, 
invest with somebody who's smarter than you and who has a track record. You don't have to listen to your brother-in-law who says he's smarter than you. I'm looking for somebody that's got many years in the business that has a better track record. And Warren Buffett has that. So for me, as you look at all these things, stocks are one of the things you can do. And if you really want to buy some stocks, you think that Apple's going to do well or, or Amazon or whatever, take a small percent of all the money that's coming in, take a small percentage of that and put it into that account and buy and sell what you want. You might want to do uh, trading on paper and do that for a while to prove that your system, that you're, you're smarter than Buffett, but uh, um, you can do the individual stocks. You can put money into mutual funds. The challenge with mutual funds is that there are fees, there are load fees, there's commissions, and there's money under management fees. So if, you're, if your stock went up 6%, your mutual fund went up 6%, but they took 3% from you, or two, let's say 2% from you in fees, that just cut off 30% of the profits that you would have made in fees. And so that's one of the reasons why an index fund will do better, because the fees are much less. The fees are a lot less than they would be in a mutual fund. And so that's why they do better. Um, Steve Wynn, I was reading a book about Steve Wynn, and of course many of you know he has uh, Wynn Casinos. He was the one that uh, created the Bellagio, Treasure Island, Mirage, uh, just an incredible businessman. Um, I don't believe in gambling, um, but uh, you know, this is what he said. He says, when, when people come to my casino, some people are going to win, some people are going to lose. Some, th that's just the nature of the beast. Every game is rigged for us to make a percentage of profit. What I know is, is that if you walk into that casino, on average, and I don't know who's going to win, I don't, I don't know who's going to lose, I don't care. We're going to take 20% off you. So if you walk in with $1,000, we're going to take 20% off you or $200 is how much money that we're going to make. So you can either try and gamble and win or lose or bet on the casino. And so this is basically the strategy for betting on the casino is basically betting on an index fund. We're going to buy the 500 biggest companies in America. They're global. They're everywhere. Starbucks is everywhere. Coca-Cola is everywhere. McDonald's is everywhere. And by the way, the hamburgers are just as bad in uh, around the world in India as they are in America, um, except for their veggie burgers because most of the people are vegetarians in India. Uh, but anyway, so that's the next one. And then the last one, of course, is Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway is an individual stock, but it acts like a mutual company or an index company because they own hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of businesses over the last 50 years. And so the concept is very simple. The problem with individual stocks is you don't know when to buy, you don't know when to sell, and you're not smarter than somebody else. And you don't have $105 billion in free money that you're bringing in, in insurance premiums that you don't have to pay anything on. Uh, you, you know, you have a cost of money. He has no cost of money billions, hundreds of billions of dollars that he can use. So that's one of the challenges there. A mutual fund, um, only about 20 to 30 percent of the mutual funds out there outperform an index fund. So of all the mutual funds out there, the vast majority of them don't do better than an index fund like the S&P 500 or the, or, or the Dow because of the extra fees. And Berkshire Hathaway has done better than the S&P 500 on a consistent basis over the last 40 years. So what I'm looking for in more long-term growth is we're looking for to put money in every month. This is your formula. Add money every month times a better rate of return. Berkshire Hathaway, on average, um, the vast majority of average has outperformed the S&P 500, which outperforms the mutual funds, which outperforms most of the individual stocks. So we want to put money in on a monthly basis times a very good rate of return. Some years, Berkshire Hathaway was doing 15, 20%. Now, the larger the company gets, the harder it is for them to reproduce those kind of, of results. And, and people say, well, you know, Warren Buffett, you know, he's 87. Uh, I've been to three of his conventions. He has hundreds and hundreds of managers, people that own these companies and these businesses that sold to him because they wanted to be part of the big Berkshire Hathaway family they still manage it. He doesn't manage any business. He probably spends six of his eight hours a day reading. Uh, and all he's doing is, is feeding his mind in his computer. Um, and he's the one that really kind of 
helps determine where those assets are going. But he doesn't manage them. He has people that manage them that really were the ones that created the business to begin with. Okay. So we want a good rate of return, and this one has outdone any of these other ones. And then we want to do that over a long period of time. The longer the time we have, the more probability we have for things to double in value. The rule of 72 says if you take 72 and you divide the rate of return into it, we'll tell you how many years it will be to double. If you're putting your money into checking account, savings account, at 1%, it's going to take 72 years for that to double. If you're putting money into a bond, 3 into 72 goes 24 times. It takes 24 years for your bond to double in value. If you're putting it into a mutual fund or an index fund and it goes up 6%, 6 into 72 is 12. It takes 12 years for your uh, mutual fund or index fund to, to double in value. And of course, if you're buying Berkshire Hathaway, it's done better. I'm just going to use a little bit, 7.2. Sometimes it's 10%, sometimes it's higher than that. Uh, into 72 equals 10 years. This one is going to double faster than the rest of those. So really that's what you're trying to do, is, is that you're trying to asset allocate your money. Now when you're younger, you're going to put more money over here. You're going to put more money into your stocks and mutual funds. When you get older and you're saying, hey, I've got enough money, I don't want to take a chance of the market going the other direction, um, I'm retired, um, and I just want to move more of my money, you're going to take out of $100, you're going to start shifting it over here. When you're young, you have a long time for your money to grow, and you have a chance to take risks. You're going to push more of your money over here. Uh, in fact, most people that are very young should have the vast majority of their money over here. And again, Warren Buffett says that if I was to pass away and I was to tell uh, my wife what she should do with the money, I'd tell her just to go buy you know, the S&P 500. Well, the reality is, is that if you buy Berkshire Hathaway, you'll be better than any of them. Anyway, this has been Tom Painter. Thank you so much for joining in our class. Uh, do some research. Uh, go on YouTube, watch videos, and learn. And number one is you need to pass this along to someone else. If you could only give one thing to somebody you love, uh, money or knowledge, what would you give them? Well, you would give them knowledge. But what's even more important is to give them an experience. And so we want you to be able to take your um, knowledge and give it experience. It's harder for you to teach your children. It's harder to be able to talk to them and actually to do it with them. But you know, when you're going to the bank, let's go to the bank kids. When we're looking at houses, let's go look at houses. Um, the most important thing you can do is to teach others. My father passed away last year and uh, he taught all of our us kids by example. And he did something very interesting. Um, in 1984 he had um, a handful of grandkids. And uh, he got together with my brother and says, let's create some investment accounts for all these grandkids. And so they funneled some of the profits from the business to the grandkids. And he planted a money tree for each of those grandkids. Uh, today, um, my father's passed away, um, but there are now 69 grand and great-grandchildren. And all those grandchildren have a financial start because my dad, their grandfather and grandmother planted that money tree. And they watered it for many years and took care of those investments while those children were growing. And then we've taught the kids, the grandkids and the great grandkids about money. And now the goal is to be able to give them a better experience. That's what your goal is too, um, is to be able to do that. Anyway, this is Tom Painter. Thank you so much for being in our class. And uh, your goal is to go share this with someone else. Um, your also goal is, is to be able to help someone else by giving them knowledge and experience. Thanks for being in the class. Talk to you later.